everyone. I'm Sarah Pacini. I'm the Assistant Director at the Lackawanna Historical Society, and this is the first installment of Lackawanna Past Times. Um, we're excited to be able to share some of our historical programming with you online. Um, and I have to admit, this is the second version rather than the first, since I forgot to record the first version. Um, so I'm, I'm redoing it, um, so I'm able to share some of our research about the 1918 Spanish flu. Um, for, for the Centennial of Spanish Flu in 2020. I did a lot of research using the Scranton Times and the Scranton Republican newspapers to kind of look at how what how the experience was in Scranton um, from the beginning of it in August through the end of the year, um, looking at how what was what was closed, what worked, what didn't, um, and what the what the final outcomes were. Um, I hope to be able to share my my screen with you so you can see the the PowerPoint and follow along with some of the the newspaper newspaper clippings. Um, you'll, you may find some things as I'm going through that sound very familiar um, to what's going on around us today and some things that are a little bit different uh, based on the, on the times. Um, to start with, Spanish flu in 1918 had really very little to do with Spain. Um, depending on the resources, there's a debate if it started either somewhere in Asia or in a small town in Kansas. Um, it was a version. It was an avian flu, a uh, version of the H1N1 flu that swept through in 2009. Um, but it's called Spanish flu mainly because, at the time, Spain was a non-combatant during, during World War One, and their press was uncensored. So most of the first reports that people saw of this flu came out of Spain. So it took the name as as Spanish flu. Um, World um, World War One mobilization played a huge role in the flu's impact and its spread. Um, there was suddenly a lot more people traveling, a lot more people in smaller spaces um, as troops were called up and mobilized and spread all over the world and then returned back to where they where they lived. So that had a, a huge part in the in the spread of the the spread of the flu. Um, the flu itself was just a flu. Um, generally, it was you know, fever, fever, chills, body aches, cough. Um, in its worst cases, it turned into a, a severe pneumonia. Um, most people who died of Spanish flu actually died of the secondary pneumonia. Um, it was reported as being a very, very strong sensation. Um, there were stories of body aches, felt like your bones were breaking, um, chills were so severe that you were, the, your bed would kind of rattle across the floor um, in, a, in a hospital ward. Um, there were headaches that would cause temporary blindness, um, all kinds of really grim kind of things. Um, doctors compared autopsies of some victims who had died of the, of the pneumonia from the flu um, to looking very similar to those who had died of mustard gas on the front um, from the, the destruction that was done um, in your lungs from the, from the pneumonia. Um, when flu started um, in the, the virulent spread that, that spread around the world, um, the end of the end of August um, was the kind of the, the beginning of it. Um, three cases right around the around the world at the at the same spot. Uh, there was a, a coaling station in Sierra Leone um, where a British troop ship had stopped. Um, within two within two or three days, there were about a third of the population um, of, of the town of the town had this had this flu. Um, also, similarly, a disembarkation point in Brest in France, um, where American troops were, were coming in and mingling then with French troops to spread out to the front. Um, there was a, a naval hospital there where they, the cases started ending up. Um, the hospital was, was overwhelmed within a week. Um, 370 people died in a, in a week of the, of the flu. Um, when the flu came to the United States, it started primarily in, in Boston at um, Commonwealth Pier, the Navy Pier there, um, and then spread into the civilian population um, as cases overran the, the Naval Hospital. Um, extended in sending into, into the Army, into nearby, um, nearby Camp Devens. Devens comes up as one of the first, the first serious cases of um, this wide-reaching flu that um, goes through very, very, very quickly. I'm going to switch to my, my PowerPoint. So you could see the, the information from Scranton. Okay. There we go. Um, 
from from when the when the flu came in the United States when it started in in Boston um, from the the port towns it then spread to to Philadelphia and into um, into New Orleans primarily on on troop ships um, of the mobilization of of men back and forth um, Philadelphia takes a, a lot of blame um, once they saw the the first the first cases that appeared um, in the in the ports uh, within a, a few days a few days later uh, Philadelphia hosted a Liberty Loan parade. Um, it had been scheduled for a long time. It was a big deal. Um, the parade was scheduled for September 28th. Um, people were concerned that they would be considered slackers or shirkers um, who weren't participating in the loan effort if they didn't go to the parade, didn't support the war. Um, so they went, they held the parade, they went. Um, there were hundreds of thousands of people in the streets in Philadelphia. And within three days, um, the city's 31 hospitals were overwhelmed with flu cases. Um, the story in Scranton starts out an awful lot like that. Um, also, the same day, again, September 28th, um, Scranton had its Liberty Loan Parade. Um, there was the parade, there was a, um, a, a rally at the Armory with, music, with musical guests and singers and a dance. Uh, there was a trench supper in Courthouse Square, which sounds like a lot of fun. Um, there were, you know, groups of, of Boy Scouts and Rotarians in the Kiwanis Club, the Knights of Columbus, who were part of the parade. Um, there were thousands of people in the streets to watch the parade. Um, it was successful in their, in their goal of raising money for the Liberty Loan Drive. Uh, they raised $1.6 million, um, but from there, they also got very, very sick. Um, within 48 hours, uh, just enough time for the incubation of the virus, um, the Scranton Republican reported the first cases of flu in Bellevue in West Scranton. Um, the paper noted that Bellevue is all one shudder and tremendous sneeze with an estimated 300 cases of what they called the grip um, in that section of Scranton with uh, doctors making house calls, uh, Dr. Brown's pharmacy on Princeton Avenue was working overtime to keep up with, um, keep up with, with, the, with the prescriptions that were, that were coming in. Uh, the first reports that started to reach the city of deaths were primarily coming from, um, from military bases, um, soldiers who were away, away training um, or coming or going from, from deployments. Uh, one of the most recognizable is Ambrose Revels from Archibald. Uh, Revels was the, the, parent, the, ch ch the son of uh, prominent parents. Uh, he was a, a contractor who comes himself. Uh, when he volunteered for the draft, he was sent to be the construction foreman uh, for the construction of a, a camp at Camp Forest in Georgia. Uh, he was later transferred to Camp Devens, uh, where he got pneumonia in the, the first days of the flu outbreak and died of the, uh, died of, of the pneumonia from the, from the flu. Um, Revels was later honored as the namesake for the American Legion post in Archibald. Uh, Scranton's proximity to Camp Summerall, um, which is an early name of what's today Joe Hanna Army Depot, um, caused a, another, another connection to the flu. Um, camp Summerall was a, a, full, a full and active, active Army camp. Um, when the flu cases started to appear, there was a call for nurses from local towns to go in and help at the, at the base. Uh, there were four nurses from Wilkes-Barre who went initially. Uh, one of them, a woman named Ethel Hobbs, um, died within days of her arrival on October 4th, um, died of, of the flu. Dr. Samuel Longstreet was the director of public health in Scranton. Um, he tried to help curtail um, the, the, spread of, the spread of the flu. He warned people not to consider it as a, a trivial disease, um, even though flu had always been around, it was a common thing. Uh, he recognized that this one was, this one was different um, and tried to warn people to take it, to take it seriously. Um, he recommended that sick people should not be out in public for at least a week after their illness, um, thinking that there could be a, a recurrence of the, of the disease that would, that would come back. Um, as far as specific symptoms, Longstreet just said, there is little question about it. When you get it, you'll know. Um, as of October 4th, uh, 1918, much like today, um, within a, a week or so of the, the first, uh, first cases appearing, everything fun was closed. Um, the saloons, theaters, bars, dance halls, any public gatherings were canceled. Uh, the schools would be closed the week later. Um, and they also started placarding um, houses. If you, if you or someone in your family had Spanish flu, um, they would come put a sign on your door that the house contained epidemic influenza 
and that anybody who lived in that house would have had to remain under quarantine for 21 days. Um, the, the closures didn't really do much to, to abate the, the spread of the flu. Um, on October 10th, which is, you know, 10, 10 days between, 10 days before the, the beginning of the, of the flu, um, there were more than a thousand cases of influenza. The next day it went up to 1300, um, 48 people were, were killed. Um, churches were closed. The, um, there was a priest in, in Oliphant who tried to have an, an open air mass to try and give people a, a chance to, to worship. Um, that idea was, was nixed. Um, as a, as a, a gathering to not not bring people together even in even in open open air. Um, I think when it came right down to it, it ended up pouring rain that day, so he couldn't couldn't do it anyway. Um, but he did try. Um, in Scranton, Mayor Connell ordered that the church bells would be rung at noon um, to give people a chance to to worship in their own homes and have a sense of of community anyway. That perhaps everybody else was was praying at the same time, even if you couldn't be together, there was still an idea of um, community and solidarity. Um, the flu in 1918, there was really very little they could do about it. Um, you were relying primarily on palliative care from nurses. Um, keep warm, keep dry, have chicken soup. Um, there wasn't really much they could, they could do. Um, the World War I in Europe had drawn a lot of nurses to the front to work in field hospitals. So there weren't that many trained nurses left in the towns to help deal with the, with the flu crisis. So a lot of the towns put out calls for, for volunteer nurses. Um, school teachers who were, out of, who were out of school, who weren't working, a lot of them stepped in to help as well, um, to kind of fill in, fill in the gaps. Um, there were a lot of things that came out that were maybe not so effective attempts at cures. Um, uh, Bozak's Horkovino was made in Scranton. It was a, a patent medicine that was basically port wine and licorice. Um, I'm sure it was delicious but I don't know how effective it was against the flu, um, but it was put forward as a, a possible, um, possible cure or defense against the flu. Um, and also you see reports of department stores advertising, if you get new shoes, your feet will be dry and you'll lessen your chances of, your chances of flu. Um, they were trying, trying to do anything to, to help people to make them feel better and maybe kind of stop the, the spread of the disease. The religious community in Scranton played a big role as well. Um, Bishop Hoban asked nuns from the Immaculate Heart of Mary uh, to help out in Taylor after the town's two doctors came down with flu. Um, and there were nuns from other, other smaller Catholic convents that got involved staffing private hospitals and smaller hospitals, um, and also staffing emergency shelters for children whose parents were, were too ill to take care of them. Um, the Sisters of Mercy operated Mercy Hospital in Scranton. Um, four of them ended up dying of flu. Um, of the IHM sisters who were involved, two of them were hospitalized for the flu but survived. But survived. As the flu spread, um, hospitals couldn't, couldn't cope. There weren't enough doctors, so emergency hospitals started to be opened. Um, the first one was in the Watrous Armory in Scranton, opened on October, October 12th, um, with space for 500 people in the, 500 500 patients in the drill hall at the hospital. Um, by October 12th, there were 1,500 cases of flu in Scranton. Um, when the hospital opened in the armory, it was, it was a, a community effort. Um, Dr. H.W. Albertson was placed in charge of the hospital, and Dr. Anna Clark, who had been the, the first female doctor in the area, uh, she was in charge of the nurses. Um, Ms. Ann Jones, who was the dietitian at the Technical High School, um, was in charge of nutrition in the hospital. And Mrs. Grant Siebert, who is the Chief of Domestic Science Department at ICS, was in charge of housekeeping. Um, in order to fill the hospital and staff it and stock it, um, Mayor Connell asked for donations of old, old linens, bedpans, and screens to be able to, to, fill, the, to fill the hospital. Um, one, of the, one of the other problems from the flu, um, because it was having such a, a rapid, rapid death rate, um, by October 15th, there were 101, 101 deaths. Um, they were kind of, cases were kind of overwhelming undertakers. Um, there was actually a scarcity of caskets. Um, the Miller Casket Company started 24-hour production to cope with orders that they said were had a 60% increase in, in orders. Um, undertakers started reporting uh, having to wait in cemeteries for grave diggers to be done. 
um, they couldn't couldn't handle the the volume of um, of funerals that they had to they had to take care of. Um, I in my research I wasn't able to find anything in Scranton about um, there were never mass graves or anything like anything quite that that dire. Um, in Philadelphia there were cases of um, of mass graves and seminary students being pressed into service as um, as grave diggers. As far as I could find, everyone who died of the flu in Scranton was buried in um, in private cemetery private cemetery plots. There were just a lot more funerals than there, there normally were. Um, as the flu spread, obviously it wasn't just in Scranton, um, just the news coverage tends to focus more, hi more highly on, um, on Scranton. By October 18th, um, there's, there were reported 4,442 cases of flu in Lackawanna County. Um, a tent hospital was set up outside the Mid Valley Hospital for 25 to 30 patients in Beckville and hospitals were opened in the high schools in Simpson, Archibald, and Old Forge. Um, the nuns from Holy Ghost and St. Patrick's Convent, along with the Daughters of St. Cyril and Methodius, opened an emergency hospital in Oliphant in the Knights of Columbus Hall. Um, and again, there are more of those, uh, the shelters for, for children to stay in um, while, their parents were, while their parents were recovering. Um, a couple, couple more kind of different or not relevant or not not relative into, relevant to today um, changes that were that were made. Um, Samter's this article in the, in the center from uh, the Samter's brother's store. Uh, the store was closed in the evenings uh, when they cut down on their Saturday shopping hours. Um, before they had the term for social distancing, uh, that's what that's what they were doing. They understood the the necessity to keep larger groups of people away. Um, so trying to cut down on the on the amount of time that. The store was open in popular hours and people would normally normally congregate. Um, because it was October, Halloween was canceled for that year. Um, part of it was Dr. Longstreet urging people to not run around being doorbells and not cause that the chaos of, um, of Halloween. People were, people were recovering, people were sick, let's leave them alone. Um, also, the um, milk delivery was, was changed. Um, in houses that were, were placarded with epidemic influenza, um, milkmen were told not to deliver milk to them because um, they didn't want the, the bottles to be put back into circulation, but family members were allowed to put out their own empty bottles and then milkmen would fill them. So they could still get milk, just not quite in the, in the, same, the same way they had in the past. I just wanted to highlight a couple people um, who were reported in the, in the death toll in, in Scranton. Um, after October 7th, the Scranton Times started to publish a list of influenza deaths. Um, as the list gets longer and longer toward the middle of the month, they started to separate out um, deaths in Scranton and deaths in other towns. Um, but all they were doing was listing, listing a name and an address so you could kind of keep up with, um, with who was dying of, of influenza. Uh, some of them I was able to find death certificates for just to get a little bit more information about them. Uh, Miss Ruby G. Adams was a 25-year-old clerk for the DLNW Railroad, and Benjamin Davis was a 31-year-old manager of the Economy Furniture Store. Um, some of them appear if there's they give you a little bit more information if they were if they were family members. Um, on October 16th, Mrs. Jesse Jones and Mrs. Arthur Luce appeared on the list, um, with notation that they were sisters. Um, also on the list that day, um, there's a little bit more information if they're volunteer nurses who die um, serving in a, in a hospital or uh, soldiers, again, in, um, in army camps. On October 17th, the Reverend Cornelius McHugh, who was the pastor of Holy Cross Parish in Scranton, made the list, um, as well as Atlas Hazen. Um, I include him just because his death certificate lists his occupation as married, uh, which I assume was just a, a clerical error on the part of an overworked clerk, um, but it did kind of make me, make me chuckle. Um, some of them that are a little a little sadder than that. Um, there are several listings as these on October 22nd. Um, Mrs. M. Sear of, of Vandling, an infant, and Mrs. E. Jones and uh, of infant and, and yeah, an infant. Um, there are listings for listings for whole families together or for the mother and the baby. Uh, some cases who were a little bit more famous, a little more well known, got a little more recognition. Um, Tom Garrity was a newspaper, newspaper reporter who had been covering the influenza um, for the Scranton Republican. He died on October 14th after a week's illness. 
Um, the Republican called him a martyr to duty who died a man's death as he had lived a man's life. Um, by October 31st, the flu was was waning. Um, there were still there were still new cases. Um, there had been 112 cases reported in the previous 24 hours, um, but it was certainly down from a peak of 200 or so new cases in the middle of the month. Um, you could see in the middle of the screen there um, the list of of how the the progression of of the disease through through Scranton. Um, but it was the the worst of it was was over by the end of October. Um, by like November 6th, there were only 10 new cases in a 24-hour period. So it was still around, it was just going, going down. On November 9th, the closing ban was lifted. Um, theaters, saloons, and churches would be, would be reopened. Um, Dr. Longstreet tried to warn people not to get too crazy. Um, you can go out, things were open again, um, but again, try and still maintain the, the social distancing. Um, don't, don't get too, too involved, too crazy, don't get too close to people. Um, so there was, there was, of course, still, still flu around. Um, and then obviously on November 11th um, was, the, was the end of the war. Uh, with the end of the war, the end of the flu gets kind of harder and harder to track. Um, I'm not sure if it's a case of once the war was over, not really wanting to report any bad news after that. Um, so there's, there's less and less mention of flu. Um, and also certainly the infection rate was, was going down. Uh, this is just a, a general a general overview of um, the deaths from the flu through the middle of December. Um, that works out to be a little more than, than 900 deaths um, by the end of December. The Republican the Republican reported um, I think 1,042 deaths I believe um, in Scranton for for three months. Um, most of those happened occurred in in October, um, and then less less and less after that. Um, there were still, were still cases around. Um, there was a short period of uh, bars, bars and hotels being closed again in December, but it didn't, um, it didn't last long. Um, and again, also, it's, it's harder to track. It kind of loses, it loses the public interest. Um, it wasn't a, a public health crisis anymore. It was a, a relatively minor personal problem if you, if you, had, the, if you had the flu. Um, overall, in Pennsylvania, um, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, and Scranton had the highest, highest death tolls, um, had a lot to do with population, basically. Uh, Philadelphia was a port, um, Pittsburgh had, was the industrial steel town, and Scranton was also heavily involved in industry with, um, with coal and silk and other, um, other industries that were needed, that were needed for the war. Um, to, co to kind of compare and contrast, in nearby Wayne County that was rural, um, population was 28,000 people in 1918. Um, there were 173 flu deaths recorded in Wayne County total um, in 1918, but of those 173 deaths, almost a third of them, um, 58, were reported in Canaan Township, which is the home to Farview Prison. Um, so again, there was a, a population smushed together in a, in a small space, um, had a, a higher rate of contagion and of infection. Um, when the flu when the flu ended, it there was no no vaccine, there was no cure for it. It kind of ran out of people to ran out of the number of people to infect. Um, there was a proportion of enough people had been had been sick who were who had recovered, who were immune to it. There was really no place else for the for the flu to, to go to spread. Um, so it kind of kind of just sort of petered kind of petered out undramatically. Um, the first flu vaccine was synthesized in 1938. Um, today, flu vaccines are recommended for everybody, but especially the old and the, especially the very old and the very young. Um, the flu does still kill roughly 30,000 people every year in the United States. Um, it is still around, um, but not nearly as, as severe as it was in, um, in 1918. Every year, the strain is a little bit different. Um, now we're deep in the throes of the, of the coronavirus pandemic. Um, we're seeing some of the, some of the same things coming up. Um, one difference in 1918 that maybe is, is a little harder to understand today. Um, at the time in 1918, there were still, I don't want to say epidemics were common, um, but there was still, there was still cholera, there was still scarlet fever, there were no vaccines for anything really. Um, so pe people understood the idea of keep away from an area where, where sick people were. There wasn't that kind of education 
gap um, to explain why you had to quarantine, um, why you have to have to stay away, have to have to stay home. Um, they had that kind of more more common experience with um, with the epidemic diseases. So it's, it's interesting to kind of compare and contrast the two topics and see how they um, how they worked, how they worked out, how they were how they were different. So as we're as we're moving forward, um, keep in mind some of the lessons from from Spanish flu. Um, otherwise, stay home, stay well, and wash your hands. Um, please tune in again next week. Um, we will have a presentation from our guest pre presenter Stephanie Longo, who will talk about Italian festivals in Scranton. So. Have a good day and thank you.